So the last class, uh, we discussed about the factors which affect the exchange rates and the demand. We also discussed just briefly about the carry trade. So just let's review, discuss with your partner what is the carry trade. Trade is buying and selling. <coughs> what kind of trade is it? With a high interest rate, there will be more demand, the price will go up, yes? How does it work, the carry trade? If I want to do a carry trade, what should I do? <clears throat> now I want to do a carry trade, so what should do I need to do? What do I need to sell and what do I need to buy? Keep a high interest rate currency or keep a low interest rate currency? So let's go to buy. What are you going to buy? The high interest rate currency or the low interest rate currency? High interest rate currency. I'm asking you. If you don't know, tell me you don't know and I'll ask somebody else. I'm trying to help you to think about the answer. Okay, then I'll ask somebody else. Okay. So, uh, it's okay. Choi on song, or is it Choi on song? Yes. Get along. We we're going to get along in the low interest rate currency. Which one are we going to sell, and which one are we going to buy? Okay. 
Which one do you want to keep? A currency which gives you a high interest or a currency which gives you low interest? Which one do you prefer? Hi, so which one are you going to sell and which one are you going to buy? Do you, do you prefer green bicycles or pink bicycles? <laughs> which do you prefer, green bicycles or pink bicycles? <laughs> yeah. right, uh, are you going to buy or sell the yellow bicycles? If you like yellow bicycles and you don't like pink bicycles, which one are you going to buy and which one are you going to sell? Buy the high interest rate currency and sell the low interest rate currency. Okay? So, at the end of the year, when we change this high interest rate currency back, do we want the exchange rate to change much or stay the same? Is anybody changed? Do we want the exchange rate to change or do we want it to stay the same? Stay the same, then we'll make a profit, okay? When we change back, we'll make a profit. But if the interest rate change, if our the high interest rate currency gets stronger, we're happy, okay? We get even more profit. May be the case. But it, it it works sometimes, it doesn't work sometimes. So let's see and uh, just to make a clearer example, it doesn't work. I get a loan of a currency, let's say a currency is currency A, okay, and I buy the currency B. So the exchange rate is 1A is 2B, okay, at the start of the year. The interest rate in A is 10% and B is 20%, okay. So I got a loan at 10% and I'm depositing at 20%. If the exchange rate stays the same, how much profit did I make? Let's say I, I, I have 100A. So I get a loan of 100A, I sell 100A, how many B am I going to get at this exchange rate? One to two. 100A is how many B? 200. 200 B, right? Then I get the 20% interest. How much money will I have at the end of the year? 240. So I have 240 B, right? Okay, at the end of the year. Then we have two cases. Case one, the exchange rate changes. 1A is 1B. Okay, case two, the exchange rate changes. 1A is 4B. Which are you going to be happier with? 1A, one, 1B. One one yeah, in this case, how many A will you get back? 240. 240. What was your profit? Uh, 130. 130, right? You have to pay 10% for the loan. Uh -huh. Okay, so your profit is going to be here. At the end of the year, you change your 240B, you're going to get 240A. So in case 1, going to be 240A minus 110, it's going to be 138. Did you make a nice profit? Yes. Right. What about in this case? 1A goes to 4B. Number 2. How many A are you going to get back here? 60. How many A did you spend at the start of the year? How much money did you lose? Minus. Okay, so that's the risk of the carry trade. Okay? Depends on the exchange rate. If the exchange rate changes at the end of the year, my currency gets stronger, the currency I bought gets stronger, I'm happy, okay? Then I get more money. But if the currency I bought gets very weak, then I'm going, I can lose money. So that's the risk you take. So that's why carry trade is more popular when the exchange rate is stable, not changing much. There's not much risk in the world. The world the economy is very stable and the exchange rate is not changing much. So, do you have any questions about the carry trade? No.
So we have different exchange rate regimes, right? We, can you remember the three exchange rate regimes? Yes. What are they? Floating. Floating. Yes. Managed. Managed. Okay. Paid. Paid. Okay. Which one is the most volatile? Do you understand volatile? Floating. Floating. Okay. Volatile is a French word. It means we also use this in chemistry. So if I have a volatile liquid, I put the two things together and it makes an explosion. That's a volatile. We can also use volatile for people, right? So one day I'm talking to you and we're fine and there's no problem. But the next day you're shouting at me and really angry and you hate me. That's, you're a volatile person, right? Change very quickly without any warning. Are you volatile? No. So <coughs> we also have volatility for exchange rates. So it means are they changing a little or changing a lot? Obviously the pegged currency is not changing at all. That's not volatile. Okay? So between managed float and free floating, the free floating is more volatile. So Given the different exchange rate regimes which confront global firms and global investors, an important question is whether there is a difference in exchange rate volatility from one regime to another. So you just said yes, the floating one is more volatile. Okay? Another question. What happens when we change our regime? What happens to volatility? If we decide to change our exchange rate regime, are we going to have more volatility or less volatility in that period? More, more volatility, right? So here we can have measured the, current, the volatility. We can measure the volatility, like standard deviation. Do you understand standard deviation? So how far does it go away from the average? Okay. Uh, floating currencies, this is monthly data. British pound is 2.3%. Change usually, right? Yen, Australian dollar, Euro. Managed <coughs> currency, the do Singapore dollar, just 1.2 percent. Pegged currency, just a very small amount. They allow pegged currency, they allow just to move a very small amount around, uh, like 0.12 percent. So here we can see which one is which color is more volatile. Red. What's the red one? GBP. What's GBP? British, British pound. Okay, what's the least volatile one? Hong Kong dollar. Purple, the Hong Kong dollar. And then you can see the Singapore dollar is managed in between. So here we can see clearly volatility of the different exchange rate regimes. Okay. So again, this is weekly data. How much are they changing in a week? Same situation. Okay. Daily data, the same. Again, the floating currencies are changing around 1% a day. The other one's not changing much. So that's why people don't trade these currencies. People only trade these currencies, right? If I trade the Singapore dollar or the Chinese dollar, it might change 5% in one year. Okay? Am I happy with that return if I'm an investor, 5%? Not really. Okay. I could have invested in the bank in the US bonds and gone 2%, for example, right? Here I had to trade, I had to guess, I had to make the right guess, and in the end I still only got 5%. So traders don't really like to manage to trade the managed currencies much because they don't make enough profit. Also, the managed currencies is not easy to trade. Chinese government won't allow you to buy and sell more than a certain amount of their currency every year. <coughs> Are you going to trade the Hong Kong dollar against the US dollar? No, you're just going to end up with transaction cost, buying buy and selling cost, right? So what about the, what does it look like on the graph over the longer term? Uh, we can see that uh, the Great British Pound, 1.1 pound per dollar in 1985. In 1986, just one year later, it's up to 1.5, 40% change in one year, okay? Then it gets 
the Great British Pound gets stronger again. In 1990, it's up to nearly two for one dollar. Okay, another 50%, around 50% change. So can you see the, this mouse here, right? So this is the year 85, 90, 95, 2000, right? This is the exchange rate. Then look here, this one, in just a month, a few months, from 1.9 down to 1.4, okay? And so on. So Singapore, currency against the dollar, it's getting here from 2000 to 2010, it goes from 1.8 to 1.2. Is it getting stronger or weaker against the dollar? Here I could get 1.8 1.8 Singapore dollars bought one US dollar. Here 1.2 Singapore dollars bought one US dollar. Opposite of the British pound graph, because it's on the other side, right? Singapore dollar is on the right, British pound is on the left. Okay, so it's getting stronger here. So we can see that as it's a managed currency, every year it's getting stronger. Just every year 5%, every year 5%, every year. Here there was a big drop for some reason. But then again, just following this trend of getting stronger against the US dollar. So China is more clear this is a, is a managed currency. Right? You can just look by looking at this graph, you can see it's a managed, very managed currency, right? There's no real like volatility, that kind of thing. Just the government is keeping it on a track. Every year it was getting stronger against the dollar, five or ten percent, right? Then these years they kept around the same. Then recently they also there was some in the news they weakened against the dollar. Okay? And just a very small amount, only two percent maybe. But it was still big news. <coughs> American dollar is priced down. The yeah, just recently they weakened the, their own currency. They recent weakened the Chinese yuan against the dollar. So it means the Chinese products are cheaper. Okay, so after that time, the European stock market went down and the U.S. stock market went down. Okay, because the Chinese products gets cheaper, the European companies or the American companies' product in China gets more expensive, so Chinese people might not buy as many BMWs or European products or U.S. products, right? They'll buy more, and foreigners will buy more Chinese products. So the European and U.S. stock markets went down slightly. Okay. So this is the Hong Kong dollar, the peg currency. This is since 1985. In 1985, what was the exchange rate? 7.8 Hong Kong dollars was one dollar. What's the exchange rate today? 7.8, 7. 7. right? So, Hong Kong dollar is pegged. It keeps the same. So we can see that floating currencies present the greatest risk. If you look at this graph, is this currency a big risk for countries? No. They can predict what's going to happen. They know the Chinese currency is going to get slowly, slowly, gradually stronger against the dollar. Okay? Here, we can, it's very hard. The pound is going up very quickly, going down very quickly. This year, the euro, or last year, the euro changed by 30% against the dollar. Okay? So, it means that if you are working for a company and you had your savings in dollars, or you had your savings in euros, it could have made a 30% difference to your savings, right? Or if you got a loan in dollars or a loan in euros for your company, it would also make a 30% difference, right? If the euro got 30% weaker last year, would you prefer to have gotten a loan in euros or in dollars last year if you worked in the company? Should you have got a loan in euros or dollars? Euro got weaker by 30%. Euro. We loan euro. Yes. Where do you want to deposit your money? In euros or dollars? In dollars, right? <coughs> So, if we did the other way around, we could have some risk, okay? So, these currencies are very volatile, even over the short term, monthly, weekly, and daily basis. This is a complication, doing business or investing. For who? For exporters. My price will go up 
Okay, importers, my price goes up 30%. Global asset managers, I invest in the stock market, but the euro got 30% weaker. So I invested in stocks in Europe. Am I happy? I invested in stocks in Europe and I what do I need to pay for the stocks in Europe? What currency do I need to pay? Euro. When I get my money back, what currency am I going to get back? Euros, right? I buy the stock with euros. Its stock is a paper saying I own a part of the company. When I give back the paper saying I own the part of the company, they are going to give me? Euro. Euros, right? But the euro is now worth 30% less than it was last year. So was I happy I bought stock in Europe? No. Right? If I didn't do anything to protect myself, right? We'll talk about it in the course, especially investing in stocks. They do something to protect themselves against of hedging. Global commercial banks, overseas sales, manufacturing subsidiaries. So there will be costs and returns with different markets and different investments. They, they could be stressed about, right? So global firms and global investors, they need to pay close attention to the floating currency exposures and make the right risk management tools. So the problem is, it's not that easy to forecast floating currencies, uh, right? Future. That's what you're doing on Awanda. You're trying to forecast. So you're, tr you're learning how difficult it is to forecast what's going to happen to a floating currency in the future. Okay? In the, we'll see over just the short term, it's mainly just people technical trading, people following other traders, following the trend. Okay? So it can change very quickly in the short term. So in the managed currency, the governance manage their currency to counteract the market force. You understand counteract? Act against? If you push this way, then I push this way, then I'm counteracting. Okay, so the government is counteracting the market force. So we have the market demand or supply factor is making undesirable exchange rate moves. What is an undesirable exchange rate move for China? Yes, it doesn't want its currency to become very strong. Why not? Yes, their products will be expensive. Are Chinese products price sensitive? Do you buy Chinese products because of price or quality? Price. Right? So their products are quite price sensitive. So if they if they price increase a lot, maybe you won't buy the product, right? So they need to keep there to work against undesirable exchange rate move of getting much stronger. Okay, so they intervene. So <coughs> they do this as a monetary policy target to achieve inflation target. <coughs> also Singapore used this way. So these currencies are not as volatile as floating currencies. Okay, except they might manage the exchange rate on a regular basis. Right? or just when they want to. So we already discussed about managing, buying or selling the foreign currency, right? So uh, we can we talked about buying or selling the currency or changing the interest rates to, def to affect demand and capital flow in the last class. So let's just review with what does China have to do? If there's a lot of demand, everybody wants to buy the Chinese yuan. So the Chinese yuan is getting too strong. What does the Chinese government need to do? Uh, How are they going to increase the supply? Mm -hmm. yep. Printing money or just selling? Sell. Selling their yuan against the dollar. Why? Right? Mm -hmm. We'll talk about it later. That can cause inflation, but they have other ways to control inflation in China, like managing the supply of credit. Right, stopping the loans from the banks. Uh, recently, China has reduced its interest rate five times this year. Okay. So it's also tried to reduce its interest rate to uh, weaken the currency so, and stimulate the economy. So what about the peg regime? Under the peg regime, governments link their currency to a key international currency. 
mostly the US dollar, okay? Uh, or the euro. Some countries in Africa use the euro. Or, or some mar market basket of currencies. We saw China and Singapore, they make a basket of currencies, okay? It means they're not linked to just one currency. The, bas the basket is normally, it's normally based on who, you, who do you trade with, okay? So if I'm in Denmark and I have a peg to a basket of currencies, what currency is going to be the biggest one in the basket? I'm in Denmark. The euro, right? Probably I do 80% of my trade with the euro area, okay? Then what's the next currency that's going to be in the basket? British pound. Dollar. Probably I'll do more trade with the US than Britain, okay? If, and then probably the British pound, right? Then Chinese currency or Japanese currency, right? So we won't worry too much about the small ones. We might only have four, three or four currency, big currencies in the basket, okay? And as those currencies change, we're going to change our currency too. So why do governments peg their currencies? A peg is seen as a necessary condition to promote confidence in the currency and in the country and promote economic growth. So we talked about Hong Kong having uh, pegging their currency and Saudi Arabia, right? Denmark and, and Switzerland pegging to the euro. Okay? So if I invest in Hong Kong, if I want to invest in, in Hong Kong in stocks and I buy Hong Kong dollars, can I be confident that my, I can get back the same amount? The Hong Kong dollar is not going to change a lot, right? especially if I'm an American investor or I deal in dollars. Right? I know that the Hong Kong dollar will still be the same. I can convert to the same as US dollars. Okay? So it's almost like investing in the US. Okay? So I have this kind of confidence. So I think by giving people this confidence of basically stability, do you understand stability? Then the economy can grow better because people are confident. We can encourage foreign direct investment or long-term capital inflow. So I could invest, buy a factory in Hong Kong, invest there for 10 years, make a 10-year investment in Hong Kong. Would, I make, would people be as quick to make a 10-year investment in Korea? What could happen in Korea in 10 years? Let's say I want to invest my money for 10 years and I can't touch it. I buy a 10-year bond in a company. What could happen in Korea that probably wouldn't happen in Hong Kong? War. War or some problem. Right? What could happen to the Korean won that wouldn't happen to the Hong Kong dollar? Korean one could get very weak, right? So there's one way around this, that is, when I lend money to Korean companies, I lend to them dollars, right? Or another way around that is, I don't, I will look at later some other way to manage the risk, right? But just so we can get the idea that the peg currency is a little bit more stable, okay? If we peg the currency at, a, at an undervalued currency, this may uh, help our export sector. So this is important to understand about Europe. Because Europe, in Europe we all have pegged currencies. So Europe is the most biggest pegged currency area. Do you know Europe? Yes. This is my picture of Europe. I do Ireland. <laughs> so Europe is a circle. So we have a lot of different countries in Europe, right? They all have, they all have, they all are different countries, but they all use the euro. And at the start of the euro, say Italy, they had the lira, right? Okay? And then they, they all, everybody was matched to Germany here in the center. So Germany is in the center of Europe, right? They have the Deutschmark. Do you know what the Deutschmark? Yes. So they had the Deutschmark at the start. So every currency was pegged at a certain level, right? And Let's say in Ireland we had the pound, Irish pound before, so 80 cents was equals to 1 euro, right? In Germany, let's say 2 Deutschmark is equals to 1 euro, right? In Italy, 1,000 lira is equals to 1 euro. 
So all of the countries changed their currency like this in the year 2000. But sometimes one currency could be undervalued against the other currencies, right? So some people say that Germany's currency is undervalued against the other currency, so they have some advantage. So when they set the exchange rate, fixed exchange rate, the German one was too cheap. And then in the euro, what has happened since then is that the wages or labor, do you understand labor cost? Yes. Labor cost in Germany is almost the same as in when the euro started, not much difference, right? Same. In Italy and Greece, Spain, Portugal, higher labor, much higher, say 20% higher labor cost. So nowadays, what does that mean? Which currency is undervalued? Germany against Italy or Italy against Germany? Which one is undervalued? Easier for their export sector. Germany, right? So the labor cost, the wages went up in the other countries in Europe, but in Germany they stayed stable, right? So it means that really Germany's currency is undervalued against the other currencies. Can you understand that idea? Yes. So within the pegged system, this is a problem for pegged currency, right? This is a problem now for the euro, for Greece, for Italy and Spain. Germany. Some people say that at the start, when we started the euro, Germany's currency was undervalued. Okay? And then since then, it's, going, it's gotten worse. Because German labor costs have stayed the same, and the other labor costs have gone up. So, uh, if we can do this, we can ex help our export sector. Okay? Ireland is similar to Germany. At the start, a few years ago, the euro was not a good idea for Ireland. But nowadays, Ireland's economy is growing faster than China's. One of the reasons is that, in my opinion, the Ireland is using the euro like undervalued currency, like China is using the UN like an undervalued currency, against our other trading partners in Europe. Okay, so maybe Ireland is getting more competitive and more productive, but the other countries are not getting more competitive and more productive as quickly but they're stuck in the same, pegged in the same exchange rate, okay? So in the pe if you peg your currency to another currency, you have to be careful, okay? So this, maybe in the future we can see the euro area will break up. Some people think that can happen, right? I think maybe not now, but in five or 10 years, it could be possible. If the plan doesn't work, the current plan doesn't work for Greece, then Greece could leave, then Spain might say, why are we staying in what is, we are overvalued currency, and Germany has undervalued currency, we might leave too. Okay? So this is the problem with the euro, really. So, one of the problems. So pegs can be either at a fixed rate, or in relation to a trend, that is a crawling peg. So, Hong Kong could have the same problem with the US, but Hong Kong has a very quite competitive financial industry and economy. As long as the peg is maintained, the exchange rate risk is low. There is some <coughs> variation on the daily way. The peg is maintained through market intervention, buying and selling. So in Europe, they went even further than the peg. They all have the same currency, the same currency, right? So we don't have to do mark. Before the euro came in, for two or three years, they kept the currency the same exchange rate by buying and selling every day. But nowadays they just use the same paper money. Do you have any question about this part? The type of currencies? So here we can see again the Hong Kong dollar. Hong Kong dollar's volatility, very low. Do you understand the word volatility? Yes. Saudi Arabia, same. Okay. There are some issues with the pegged currencies. As long as the peg is maintained, then we have no risk, right? So the Hong Kong looks safe because they're in pegged regime for a long time. Uh, nowadays, let's say France or Germany looks safe, they're in the pegged regime. 
But there is a problem for an even bigger risk when governments decide to abandon the peg for another foreign currency, okay, or just to a new peg. So this is was during the summer there was a lot of news about Europe because there's a big risk if Greece leaves the euro, they abandon the peg. Then this is enormous risk, okay? It's bigger risk than the vol normal volatility of the exchange rate market, okay? If what would happen? Can anybody tell me if Greece leaves the euro? Why are people worried? What would happen if Greece leaves the pegged exchange rate with the euro? Euro. What would happen? Just think, if you were an investor in Greece, so you invested money in Greek stocks, are you going to be happy that Greece leaves the euro or not? Why not? They're going to change their money to the drachma. Is the drachma going to have the same value or is it going to depreciate? Get weaker? Much weaker or a little bit weaker? A lot weaker. Okay, so they're going to change, you're going to get the money for your stocks back in drachma. Do you want drachma? No. Not really, right? It's going to be very weak. What about if you're uh, selling stuff to the Greek company? Okay, and then they, they, they want to pay you back in drachma after one year, right? But drachma is not worth much. Okay, so you can see the problems here for investors and traders. So the problem is, even before that happens, if people have some doubt about that, then they have some negative expectation, then they stop doing business with the Greek companies, or they stop investing in Greek shares, right? The Greek stock market went down a lot, okay? So, if, we, say if a country is thinking, or looks like it's going to leave the pegged regime, can cause a big problem, okay? So, these changes can occur by an orderly change adopted by the government. So, China, the government makes a long-term plan and very controlled way to leave, then that's better. Or the peg could be attacked by the market and suddenly the government changes. We have a lot of examples of this. The British pound in 1992, this is why the euro was formed in the first place, okay, we'll talk about it later. Uh, Argentina in 2002, Mexico, okay, 2000. For Asian currencies like Thailand in 1997, we'll just discuss about the case of Thailand. Okay. So these changes can have big impacts on global firms and global investors. So global firms and investors should always be alert. Are you alert? Is he alert? Are you alert? Now? Uh -huh. So we usually say alert for danger means you're watching for danger, right? Uh, so you should be alert for these. If the exchange rate changes, then it's going to be some problem. But China, until 2004, China was fixed. They were pegged to the US dollar at 8.25, okay? Like Hong Kong. And then China was under a lot of pressure because its cur people said its currency was undervalued a lot. So they got a lot of pressure and they decided to allow their currency to move. So they changed to manage floating. But it was very orderly. Do you understand orderly? Orderly means organized and controlled and everybody knew about it and it was well planned. Just like the European countries who changed to the euro, right? Very planned and organized. Then there's no crisis. Since that time, it starts to move in a, in a controlled way. The other situation is when currencies are attacked by the market. What does it mean to have your currency attacked by the market? Do all of the guys in suits get some sword and start chopping up your money? Attack your currency? No? What does it mean? What do the speculators do? They want to make profit. How are they going to make profit? Oh, if a lot of people buy more currency, it will get stronger and they will get profit from it. What did you say? Uh, manipulating the currency. They want to manipulate the currency. In the, what would be in a paid exchange rate, what do they usually want to do? 
Well, let's say in the case of uh, the UK, the UK is, is pegged to the Deutschmark, right? Say one pound is equal to four Deutschmark, just for example. Okay? And it's pegged, it's kept the same, right? Then, uh, speculators, what can they do to make profit here? You said, manipulate the exchange rate, but it's pegged. So they want to force the government to change their exchange rate regime, right? They want to force the government out of this pegged regime. Okay? Are they going to force the government out of the pegged regime by buying their currency or selling their currency? What do you think? I, I, I. No? <laughs> selling, right? So if they sell your currency, what do you have to do? To counteract, to keep in the peg. So speculators are going to sell the pound. Okay, here we can put in get a loan of first, right? Get a loan of a of pounds. They get a loan in pounds and they sell pounds. Okay. Now what does the what does the British Central Bank need to do to keep the peg? Okay, so the British Central Bank needs to buy pounds to counteract, right? Does that make sense to everybody? Yes. To keep at the same exchange rate? Okay. What is the central bank using to buy pounds? What is it using to buy pounds? Bananas? Yes, using foreign currencies or gold reserves, right? Does the British Central Bank have an endless supply of foreign currencies and gold or a limited supply of foreign currencies and gold? Limited supply. So really it's a race. Who has more money, the speculators or the British Central Bank? Okay, well, people would have thought the British Central Bank has a lot of money, right? But in this case, in that early 90s, the financial markets were getting more globalized and the investors could work together, the speculators, right? So they were actually able to get enough money together to attack the British Central Bank. What happens when the Central Bank doesn't have enough money? What's going to happen after that? They don't take the British pound. They float it. They can't buy the British pound. They have no choice. They have to float, right? There's another thing that happened in between, which is interest rates. They also raise interest rates to create demand, right? And to make it very hard, because the speculators are getting a loan in pounds, right? So if they raise the interest rates, it's expensive to get a loan, okay? And then raising interest rates creates demand. So they, they raised the interest rates to 16% in the UK at the time. But once that's finished, because people can't accept a higher raise in the interest rate, the economy is not going to function. The interest rate is too high, right? Nobody can get a loan. So that also has a limit. Interest rate raise also has a limit, and this has a limit. So in the end, speculators won. Okay? They got the exchange rate changed. Tell me a weaker exchange rate for British pound. What would be weaker here? One pound is more Deutsche Marks or less Deutsche Marks? Weaker pound. Less Deutsche Marks, right? So if they change then, one pound is equal to three Deutsche Marks, right? Now what happens? How do the speculators make a profit? They got a loan in British pounds, right? They sold the pounds and they bought Deutschmarks, right? So how did they make a profit? We just explained earlier with the carry, like the carry trade, right? When they change the money back, they're going to get back more pounds, okay? So let's say I, at this one, I changed 100 pounds. How many Deutschmarks will I get? 400. 400 Deutschmarks, right? So I have 400 Deutschmarks. How many pounds am I going to get back? 130. 130, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. Did I make a profit? Yes. Yeah. Can you see how I made a profit? Yes. Right, so I tried to, as you say, manipulate the exchange rate. Even though it's in a peg, I get a loan and I try to manipulate to go get weaker. That's how speculators attack a currency. On the other side, are speculators going to attack the currency by buying the currency? 
What's the central bank going to do if I'm buying the currency? If it's the other way around, if I'm buying your currency, what is the central bank going to do? Sell, sell the currency. Does the central bank have unlimited amount of currency to sell? Why not? They can print money, right? So they can keep printing money and selling their currency. Are the speculators going to win in this case? No, so we see the speculator attack is this way, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit later when we look at the crisis, but just we have to understand what does it mean, attack, to be attacked by the markets. This is what it means, okay? The currency is under attack. They're selling your cur getting a loan of your currency and selling it, okay? Then they hope your currency gets weaker, and later they can make a profit. So attacks occur because the market is convinced that the peg is unrealistic and unsustainable. So that's why they made the euro. The market can't attack Greece now because Greece is using the euro currency. There is no other currency that they can attack, right? So because of this problem with Britain, they decided to make the euro to stop the speculators from attacking the pegs in Europe. Do you know the phrase, put the cart before the horse? Put the cart before the horse? Do you have that phrase in your language? This is a cart. I'm very good at art, so it's very true. <laughs> and this is a horse. Right? Normally the horse is there and the cart is there. But in English, they put, if they say put the cart before the horse, it means you're doing things the wrong way around. So Europe did things the wrong way around. First they made this monetary union, the euro, before they made some political union. Okay? We don't have any political union in Europe. We still have different countries. So they should have made more economic and political union first, and then later the same currency. But you can understand that because of this kind of problem in Britain, and this is why Britain is not a member of the euro now, it was pushed out of the pegged exchange rate regime by speculators okay, in 1992. So they decided, let's make the same currency so the speculators can't attack the countries like that again. So here we can see the, the story of the British getting driven out of the exchange rate mechanism. In 1990, the UK joined Europe's exchange rate mechanism, EORA. Under this arrangement, the UK pegged the pound to the German mark at a rate of 1 to 2.95, 1 to 3. Right? Uh, during the next two years, the German economy surged. So a little bit like the euro crisis currently, right? The German economy is doing well, but the Greek economy is not doing well, right? So the German economy was doing well, and the UK economy was not doing well. So, in 1992, Germany raised the interest rate, and the UK was forced to follow. So in the pegged exchange rate regime, you have to follow with the interest rate change. So in September 1992, George Soros decided to bet against the pound. He's a speculator. He thought it was overvalued. And his hedge fund started selling pounds short. So just like nowadays, I think the Greek currency is overvalued against the German one, if they have one, right? So they started selling pounds short, means they started getting a loan of pounds and selling them, hoping the price would get lower. Remember, short means hoping the price will get lower. So selling pounds, hoping the price will get lower. Okay? The UK responded by buying pounds and selling US dollars, and by raising interest rates to 12 and then 15 percent. On September the 17th, the UK government announced they were leaving the exchange rate mechanism. So here we can see the time. Here they are in the 2.9 and 3 band that they agreed, right? And then suddenly they left. The exchange rate changed from 2.9 down to 2.5, right? So a sudden change of the exchange rate. So speculators could make some profit. But of course, after this time, some people suggested, of course, the British politicians complained about George Soros, and they said he's a really bad man. But two years after the crisis, some British economists want to put a statue of George Soros in the centre of London. Why do you think that was? 
what happened to the British economy after they devalued their currency? What do you think happened? The British currency got a lot weaker. What happened to their economy? Got better or got worse? Got better. Why? More competitive, right? The weaker currency allowed their economy to be more competitive. The unemployment was 15%. The unemployment went down to 7 or 6%, right? And uh, they solved a lot of their problems in, by this way. So then let's take a break now for 10 minutes.